so what we have here is a fantastic presentation about kind of hidden creativity in the world around us by the hacker in chief, which I think is a great job title. Uh, this is Justin Levinson. Do we think this is going to work first time? Maybe. Okay. Okay. Good. So if you go down to Chinatown, uh, for those of us that are not New Yorkers, it's on uh, Broadway or on Bowery and Division. Uh, you'll see a bunch of these vans lined up, and there's usually a, a driver kind of sitting outside, smoking cigarettes and just chatting with each other. You walk inside the van, hand three bucks, and you make your way to the back. Uh, you try to not get the last seat, which is usually something kind of makeshift. Uh, I think last time I rode, it was an upturned Dora the Explorer bucket. It was sort of small and pink. Um, and people are just sort of chatting in, you know, in Cantonese or Mandarin. They're on the phone. They're reading newspapers. And this is how people get from Chinatown to Chinatown in New York City. And, and it's, just, it's a different experience than riding the bus or riding the subway because there was one woman who wanted to get off at the edge of the Horace Harding Expressway, and the driver did not know where that was. And suddenly the entire bus comes to life because everyone has an opinion about the best way to get to where she needs to go. And this is, uh, this is New York's informal transit system. Uh, so I, I know that no one wants you know, me to stand up here and talk about myself for 30 minutes, so that's not gonna happen. Um, I do promise that uh, there'll just be some cool stories and, like my favorite books, uh, lots of pictures and not a whole lot of writing. Um, so we're going to go through uh, a little bit about what Makeshift is, um, and then this sort of concept of hidden creativity, why it's important, why it's useful for uh, people in the creative field and other places. Uh, we're going to go through some field reports. Uh, that, you know, stuff that, that we've dug into or stuff that I've seen around New York that might be interesting that illustrates some of these concepts. And at the end, sort of how-to takeaways that you guys can apply for, uh, for your own careers. Uh, so I'm the hacker-in-chief of Makeshift, which is what happens when you let me pick my own title. And it generally means that there's a whole bunch of stuff that nobody knows how to do and no one wants to do, so I do it. Um, we are... A, uh, first and foremost, a, um, a print magazine, uh, which started in 2011. Uh, we've switched formats a little bit. But we are a field guide to hidden creativity. Uh, this was started 2011 by a, uh, a journalist who covered mostly the informal economy in Mexico and an ethnographer who is here in the United States who were interested in sort of similar areas and they wanted to tell a lot of these stories. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the landscape of print magazines right now, but um, I found out that they're not a great way to make a ton of money. So we also have digital, which is our YouTube channel, uh, where we'll do stories that come from the magazine or things that uh, we happen upon, uh, brand partnerships, that sort of thing. And then Makeshift Studios, which is more explicitly a content production, I mean, house is really overstating it since there's two people and a bunch of freelancers. But there, that's how we'll produce content for brands. So we've worked with places like Autodesk and GE to produce content either that they've already had in-house that they want to change and make available to a new audience or that they want to just come up with from whole cloth and have stories that we can tap our network for. Uh, we don't look like a traditional uh, anything, really. So we've got 15 people who are all sort of passion project involved. Uh, we have a, a giant contributor network, um, so our staff spans uh, Greece, Mexico, Spain, uh, New York, and uh, State College, Pennsylvania. We've got contributors, I, I mean, around the world, and, and that lets us be maneuverable in ways that larger agencies can't, and that's how we can compete for some of these projects, because where a big agency would have to take a bunch of people and put them on an airplane and send out the you know, art director and the creative director and the videographers and the editors, we can just tap the person who lives there and say, hey, can you go get this story for us? And we'll edit the footage back here. And that's how we can get by without a whole lot of money applied to it. 
This is the office. Uh, we use this project management tool, which is pretty good. Um, it, it's more that it lets us work in tandem when none of us are in the same place. Uh, it was an adjustment for sure, so other folks that are thinking about distributed teams, it works, it takes some time to get up to speed. Um, our editor, who is a total Luddite, hated this. Uh, so his, his method of sort of rebelling was to have his name be Low Fat Bacon to demonstrate how much he hated the tool. Uh, and <laughs> eventually he got on board and now he's, he's a total fan. Um, you know, th this lets us do something that we would not have been able to do 10 years ago. You know, we could not have, have produced a piece of content like this magazine and these sorts of cl you know, client projects that we do because the tools just weren't available. Uh, here's an office meeting. Uh, so the, there's actually been a bunch of studies, which is really interesting. Teams that are distributed are much more efficient, but much less creative. And it, it's the same mechanism at play, right? You've got the hallway conversations, which are great, which are fun, but they also distract from your work because someone's coming by your desk every 35 seconds asking questions or where something is. Uh, so we want to build in some of this face time where possible and have you know, these face-to-face -face meetings where we can do a little bit of brainstorming. Right. So, so this idea of hidden creativity, you know, it sounds sort of weird. Uh, this, is, this is how we define it for makeshift. Um, so it's, the economic fringe is this, we, we have the sense of the bubble that most of us live in. It's sort of normal society. I you know, go to Starbucks or whatever and I trade money for goods and services. I generally use a credit card. I kind of know what's happening all the time. Uh, this is, it's a little bit, you know, ethnography because that's definitely a big part of makeshift's DNA. Um, but we do, we reject a bunch of things like this idea of bottom of the pyramid, third world, like we, our editorial guidelines forbid us from using those because we believe that there's not this kind of march towards first world, you know, everyone owns like 2.5 cars and an iPad and that's, that's sort of the, the pinnacle of progress and there's these other options, these other ideas that can actually inform the formal economy and not just as like, oh, well, that's the thing that they're still working on. Uh, this might be easier. Uh, it's sort of working when you don't have a lot of resources to work with and getting things done. So this might be a little bit easier touchstone. This is kind of how I think of, of hidden creativity. Uh, so this, I'm just going to go through a few examples of stories that we've covered. Uh, so this is in Ghana in about 2009. Uh, this is a SIM card, but it's actually two SIM cards uh, that are, have been put together by this guy who will take it back into a small building and do it while you wait. This happened because there was a bunch of competing telephone carriers, you know, like T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, but not, offering deals, but only to people in network. So if you wanted to do business and you had customers who had a variety of different telephone lines and you wanted to save the most money, you need to either carry three phones or a wallet full of SIM cards, which nobody wants to do, swap them in and out all the time you had to make a call. So this guy figured out a way to, to put both of them on one and had some custom firmware in those little Nokia candy bar phones that you could dial it on any network just by switching a button in software. And Nokia about I don't know, four or five years later, figured out that this was important and this was a demand in the market and built it into the handsets out of the factory. Uh, this one, uh, these are prosthetics from Thailand. So what was happening is people would end up with, you know, farming accidents, you know, industrial accidents, disease, whatever, and they had to amputate a limb. But getting the limb fitted from the U.S. would take about a month and cost an eye-watering amount of money. So no one was doing it, and they just go home and make these themselves. So one of the doctors said, all right, well, what, what do I have access to that I can produce a limb from? So these are actually melted down yogurt bottles and beer can tabs. Uh, apparently the yogurt bottle plastic is the only one that actually worked and would withstand uh, the pressures of being used every day. And the largest one they've done is for an elephant. They actually made an elephant prosthetic out of yogurt bottles. Um, and then this one's one of my favorite, uh, partly because I really like roast duck. Uh, this is in Chengdu, um, so these are street vendors, and you can see it's kind of hacked the, the cart onto this motorcycle, and what that allows them to do is both there's these, um, they're called the Chengguan, um, sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation, I'm sure, uh, which are the, they're the police that sort of take care of civic you know, duties, which includes hassling street vendors who are parked illegally or selling where they're not supposed to. And it also allows him in the summertime to turn this into a repair cart. 
So he'll drive around when it's too hot to buy roast duck. People will go and say, hey, can you fix my bike? Can you fix my tractor? And he'll go around and do that for people. So there's this idea, right, that, you know, oh, this is all very interesting. It sounds very far away. It's in Africa. It's in Asia. Um, I'm going to go through a few things that are New York-centric. Uh, for those of you who've spent time here, you know it's kind of a big, crazy city. Uh, but there's a lot of this informal economy and this resource-constrained innovation happening here. And there's a few lessons that we might be able to take away from this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of them have informed more formal systems. Uh, but there's also some ideas of, this is ethnography, this is understanding your environment, this is understanding people that you may be working with, and it's about storytelling as well. Uh, so the first is transit. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the van in the beginning that goes from Chinatown to Chinatown. Um, those are known affectionately as dollar vans, even though they're now three bucks. So they go up and down major corridors where people want to get to and from, um, and these started mostly in the 80s. What happened was a big transit strike and people couldn't get around because there's no buses, there's no subways. So citizens took private cars, private vans, and said, all right, I'll take you to wherever you want to go for two bucks. And they loaded up their cars and ferried people around. And after the subways came back online, this still happened, and primarily in areas that were not well covered by the subway. Um, so I just want to make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, yeah, so these are seen in a lot of countries. I mean, you call them collectivos or combis or mutatus, like they, they exist almost everywhere, this idea of collective transportation along a fixed route. It's not necessarily a formal bus system. Um, and for that ride from Chinatown to Chinatown on a subway takes about an hour 10, and in the van it's about 30 minutes. Uh, so it's a big, big savings. Um, this was an awesome story that The New Yorker put out. Uh, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend checking it out. They tell a lot of stories, have videos, interviews. Um, but what's, what's really interesting is you can see the routes that the informal systems go on. And these, these gray lines, those are all the subways. And you can see where the gaps are. Uh, you know, for example, like you, can't, you just can't get from here to there without taking two trains and one all the way to the end of the line. Or this one, uh, there's one that goes up and down Flatbush Avenue. Like there's no, there's just, there, that subway doesn't exist. But a lot of people want to go shop at King's Plaza Mall. So this is a great way for them to get back and forth. Now the city has been cracking down on these forever. Uh, the enforcement is kind of more, it's kind of less. It depends on you know, what officer is looking at the people. Uh, some of the vans have been legitimized, but not everybody wants to do it. Uh, the city themselves actually tried to implement this and couldn't. They built, they built out a system, but they relegated it to, you, know, you can't have street hails, you can't run it on the bus line. So they put them on these sort of routes that nobody traveled and were you know, amazed when it failed. Um, second up is housing, uh, every New Yorker's favorite topic, because this is the only city when you can say, this is nice, how much did you pay for it, and not be you know, considered rude. Um, <laughs> despite the, hips, the, uh, the mustaches, these are not actually hipsters in a loft. Uh, this is a tenement building in the 1880s. Uh, where Jacob Reese turned his camera in on these to expose the conditions that most immigrants were living in. Um, so as a consequence, there's this giant onion skin layer of housing policy that's been built up over the last century um, of rules, and, and a bunch of stuff that you kind of wouldn't expect, like unrelated adults living together. It's an expensive city. Most of us, when we first moved here, didn't have a lot of money, so we got into an apartment with a few roommates. That's illegal. Um, you know, living underground, there's a, a weird distinction between basements and cellars. So cellars are 50% above grade or more, and then basements are lower. Basements are illegal, cellars maybe, it depends on the zone. Um, no little units, and you can't subdivide your room, and no SROs. Uh, that was after the sort of 50s, they said this is, you know, no more of this. So the informal economy immediately disregards all of these things and proceeds to do exactly what they're not allowed to do. Um, this is also out in Flushing, uh, so I, I never really thought about this stuff because I live here and I'm worried about my girlfriend and, you know, coffee and getting to work and that sort of thing. And I don't really think of, okay, oh, where, where does your cab driver live? Where does the guy who makes your bagel live? You know, the fruit vendor that you see on the street. Like, what, where do all these people live? And it's probably not in a luxury apartment in Williamsburg. They live elsewhere, and it tends to be on the outer rings, and a lot of them have, uh, they've sort of developed a way of sharing spaces. 
Uh, cab drivers in particular, because they work shifts, will often timeshare beds. Uh, so like I'll have it for the first 12 hours of the day and then I'll come home from work and or I'll go out to work and you come home from work and you can have it the rest of the time. Uh, so what was happening is a lot of these, uh, these pressure walls, you can kind of see this, this split in the middle. Um, it's just a chunk of drywall with some, some beams behind it. Uh, there was a big incident in 2009. Uh, there was a fire up in the Bronx where a bunch of people had been sharing an apartment that they subdivided into six rooms. Uh, the firefighters didn't know you know, what the layout of the apartment was because they got here in these, these extra walls and um, they all died. So after that, the city said no more and they started really cracking down on, on these sort of illegal subdivisions. Uh, basement apartments, uh, this is clearly a bachelor pad of some sort and it's, it's underground. So this is, this is definitely illegal. Um, this one's a little bit nicer. This might be where you put your mom or grandma, which is another issue because New York doesn't have a place to have extended families. So it's a city of immigrants. You know, a lot of cultures you live with multi-generations under one roof, but you don't necessarily want to make grandma like, you know, sit with the kids that are running around so she should have her own space. Some cities you can do that. You can have this accessory dwelling. In New York you can't, but people have been building them anyway. Uh, the real problem here is parking because every apartment in Queens has to have a parking space. Um, so you know, if you're if you're an immigrant, you're just coming here. You don't know a lot of people. You don't know a lot of um, you know a lot of the language. You're going to gravitate to where your culture is, and a lot of that ends up in apartments of coworkers or of friends that they have subdivided, and that's sort of this this informal system that's come up because these options don't exist for people. It's just there's no way of finding an apartment that you can afford if you first landed here and just don't know a whole lot about the city. Um, and then in another nice part of the informal economy that's not as nice, uh, there is a lot of vans, sort of unscrupulous people that will sit outside and look for signs of basement apartments, um, you know, extra cars in the garage or people coming and going at weird hours. They will then call the DOB phone in the violation and then the DOB comes in and says you have to de-renovate this and cut out the apartment. The van guy walks in and says, hey, we're a demolition company. We can take care of that problem for you. Um, in terms of informing the formal, um, there's a group called CHPC, which I believe is the Citizens Housing and Planning Council, who are doing really, really interesting work around what apartments should look like for the future of New York. Uh, they built this exhibition, which is a micro unit. I think this is a 320 square feet, you know, with lots of Murphy beds, which you remember from the 70s, and you know, these sort of contraptions that fold out and, and move around and allow you to live in a much smaller space. And this was an experiment up at the city of New York that they did a big exhibition for. Um, the last is this, uh, this idea of the sharing economy, and this is not the sort of task rabbit, indentured servitude, exploitative idea of sharing economy, but actually sharing resources. Um, and this goes on a lot here, too. Uh, this is a thing called trade school, which actually started in uh, Toronto, I believe, by a, a group called Our Goods that runs it here. So it's an education system with no money. So you barter and you can take classes. So I, you know, this, this woman's teaching how to fix a bike. She may be trading that in you know, learning web design classes or how to cook paella. You know, this, this idea of it's this community and what we need is a, a shared space where we can get into some of this without expending a whole lot of money to learn new skills, because we've all got these things that we're really good at and the things that we want to be good at, so why not match them up? Um, this is a group called 596 Acres. Um, this is a little less about sharing, more about community organizing around shared space. So the name came from, there's 596 acres of vacant lots in Brooklyn, and a lot of those are owned by Someone? It's, it's very unclear. So what this group did is they made a set of organizing tools and they found out a bunch of them are owned by the government. A lot of the, the MTA owns a bunch of these because they would build the subway underneath and have plans for some sort of building on top that never happened. So a lot just sat vacant. So what 596 Acres did is says, okay, here's a set of forms that you can clip to the fence and sign petitions and say, hey, who's interested in fixing this up? gave you some tools to research who owned this so you can ask them, and can we build something out of this? And a lot of them have been turned into parks. Um, and then the last is hackerspaces, which is sort of this weird concept of a room full of dangerous tools and smart people hanging out and making stuff together. 
Uh, this isn't new. Uh, there's lots of these. These actually came up in Germany. Uh, and now there's thousands of these around the world. Um, this is one of the ones that I helped found, um, which is, uh, it's on 14th Street in Manhattan. We've got about 700 square feet and you know, a machine shop and a laser cutter and 3D printers and all that kind of stuff. And people get really excited about this stuff, but the real value is the community. And there's this, this amazing group of people that are totally willing to share tools, share skills, share space. Uh, there's somebody left a $2,500 3D printer there and said, you guys can use this, I think you should have it. And this idea of we can, we can build this thing without shaking people down for money just for walking through the door. So it's kind of the case studies and you know, looking at things that exist right now. Um, I'm gonna go through some ideas about research, about how to find some of the stuff yourself. If you're looking at communities, you either wanna tell stories to or about. Um, I've been pretty good about no writing, but there's a few bullet points on these slides. Um, I can send out the presentation if you want it later, uh, or you can email now. Uh, so the, the big one is immersion, right? So you, there's this idea of we can understand a community that's either a, a target for a design or for communication or for messaging in this room with post-its and we can come up with personas, which is really kind of weird. And, and this idea of, you know, well, we don't, we don't need to talk to people or we can talk to some representative people is totally different than going out and spending time and sitting and learning and hanging out with people that are totally unlike you. Um, so I'm many different kinds of nerd. Uh, I'm a bike nerd, I'm a sort of hacker computer nerd, and I actually have seen a lot of stories told about both of these groups, either using the imagery or using the, you know, the idea of this you know, urban rebel biker or like the sort of dedicated hacker and they're all totally wrong. Like I, I see them and it just feels like Steve Buscemi's like, hey fellow kids kind of routine. And, in, and if, if you don't want to be an outsider and you don't want to tell a story like an outsider, then stop being one. It's really easy to go and, and hang out with a lot of folks you know, that you're not, maybe you don't understand or you're not you know, sort of familiar with, but you can find, a, you, know, you can go participate in a bike race or at least hang out where one is happening or go to a hackathon um, you know, there's some, some ideas of, of ways to, to do this. Uh, social hubs are a big one. That's, it's, could be a coffee shop, it could be a church, it could be a barber shop. You, know, you, just, you don't know where things happen, so you go out and you figure out where it is and spend time there. You, know, you, can, you can document, you can, you can talk to people, and just immersing yourself in people watching puts you leaps and bounds ahead of people who are sitting there talking to themselves in, in rooms with post-its. Um, community rituals is a really good way to do this. You know, I learned a lot by riding the dollar van. I learned a lot about communities, about where people are going, why they're going there. Uh, it's the same thing, and, and it could be, you know, church is a big one for a lot of communities, so going and sitting through services and seeing what happens, seeing how people interact afterwards tells you a lot about a community. Um, consent, obviously, you know, don't take pictures, don't take video, don't be exploitative about this. You're there to learn and not just take, so you wanna give back. Um, one of the things that I really like that we've, uh, we've shown our students, um, I taught a design class as well, uh, is go and you share the photos. So either give the people a copy of the photo if you're going to take them, or show them on the, the camera phone or the camera and say, here's the pictures, delete anything you don't like, and I promise not to use it. Um, and then connections, I mean this is really about people, it's about research, it's about understanding Make some friends, like, you know, come back a few times. People will start to get to know you. You can follow up later if you have further questions or you wanna, you wanna talk more. But it, it's really about this, this give and take idea and not just going and doing research, even if that's actually what you wanna do. Um, similar, similar veins, uh, there's this, this idea of listening. Uh, so there's, you know, everyone's operating in, in context, right? You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the guy operating the coffee cart or your, your you know, Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, everyone has a set of levers and motivations and the actions that they're taking usually are just because they exist in a system. And so understanding the motivations, the pressures that people are under and their sort of motivating levers help a lot. And it helps if you want to integrate into a community or it helps if you want to design for them or talk to them. Um, know your bias. We all have them. We all have these preconceived notions. Writing it out helps a lot. You know, these sort of things that I believe or things that I'm going in, either understanding or think that I'm understanding, 
and using that as an opportunity to go validate, but understanding that like I'm coming into this with preconceived notions and working as hard as you can to overcome them. Um, and then shutting up and listening helps a lot. Um, just sort of sitting, letting things happen around you, asking very open-ended questions, being curious, genuinely curious, genuinely engaged is just is immensely helpful and people are more than willing to teach you if it looks like that you, you actually care um, about pretty much anything really. Um, and then this one, we, I like this as a research plan. So people are like, well, I don't really know about this community or about this group. So we set them up as these kind of fun scavenger hunts with uh, a variety of points. Uh, this is the one that we ran for the class. So you had to go cash a check at a check cashing place or go find out what a street artist's biggest problem is. Um, barter a good, make something in a hacker space, find an illegal service on Craigslist, and assign point values to each one of them. So it gives you this structured research plan, but it doesn't really feel like, oh, I'm going out and doing research. It's more like, I'm going out and I'm going to learn something. I'm gonna have new experiences. Um, documentation is good. We like wide angle lenses, camera phones. Um, people have a totally different reaction to a camera phone than they do like a big SLR. It, just you know, some basic tactics of like, this should be a little bit about play because it puts you in the mindset of really wanting to learn and understand rather than it feeling like a school assignment. So this stuff is, this stuff's really everywhere. I mean, you know, this is, this is New York City, you know, ostensibly a first world capital and there's clearly a huge informal economy going on that's creative solutions to these hard problems that, you know, you just didn't think about because you never were exposed to it. And so if you, if you sort of look at the, the world that you live in and start to ask a few probing questions about what's happening around the outside, you're gonna discover like this enormous world of, of hidden stuff that has always been there, you just didn't see it. That's it, thank you. Um, I've got time for a couple questions. We have three minutes and 20 seconds. Um, every, everything that you put there was very much about hardware. Um, and obviously it's quite difficult to take a photograph of software or organizations. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about things which are more ethereal. Even something like mobile payments in, in Africa as a solution to banking. I just, sure. wonder if, I just wondered kind of what you do about things that you can't sort of see so clearly. It's definitely harder to find those. Um, it generally would start from a pain point. So as you know, you can you have sort of this idea of mobile payments exist, but you know, just for, to use your example, but you don't really know how they're being used. Uh, what actually happened is people were trading points on these different payment systems and different phone companies as payment as well. Um, so it's, it's understanding the community and going out and just trying to spend as much time there because it's harder to see because it takes longer, you need to spend that time and that effort immersing yourself, and it starts to come out slowly a little bit at a time. But it's not, it's, it, you're totally right, it's not as easy to see as like, oh, here's a van that's taking people around, I can go take pictures of that. Others? Have you stumbled across the dog yet? Um, that one I actually went out looking for because I knew they existed. Um, I've also been almost run over by several of them on Flatbush Avenue. Um, oh yeah, if you hear a weird melodic horn, just get off the street. And so I looked for that one because I knew there was one from that New Yorker article to go from, from Chinatown to Flushing. So I'm like, let me, let me try and find where it is and you can do some investigation. There's like a few photographs online you can kind of sniff out where they are. But yeah, there's, they actually exist in almost every, every city if, you're, if you sort of look where, and you generally look where people who can't afford to own a car, and if the bus system is bad, there's, there's almost always something similar to this, and you just sort of look where people are commuting to and from, and you'll probably find one. Uh, there was another one in the back, yes. I'd, uh, I think it's fascinating to look for inspiration where in these economies, because like you said, it, it usually revolves from a pain point or a problem and they're using creativity to solve it. I also think it's interesting how many of these things have developed into formal industries, things like TaskRabbit and Fiverr and Uber and Airbnb, the list goes on and on. Uh, so I guess I kind of have like a two-parter. A, do you think that's good for economies at large and society at large? And B, um, how do we how do we continue to learn from that and not look at it as like the second world, third world? I really like that notion, but how do we continue reinforcing that it's not about 
class system. It's more about solving problems. The first answer is that it's both good and bad. Um, there's not really a one size fits all, and it's good. So the, you know, taking the vans, for example, some of them go get legitimized and they pay a lot of money for the licenses and the cops actually crack down more on the, the licensed vans than they do on the unlicensed vans. And then you know, if, if it gets formalized enough, a lot of these guys don't wanna be an Uber driver. Like they don't wanna go give up half of their income to Uber. They wanna just do the thing that they're doing. On the other hand, they will get some protections and if you're living in you know, a basement apartment with no lease, you have no protections and getting some of that is definitely a valuable thing. So it really depends and there's not, there's not a good answer. And some things maybe should stay informal and some things probably could use a little more formalization. Um, and as far as the, the other one, it's, there's this desire especially as people who work in business that like we need to make money off of stuff and you make money off of stuff by making it more efficient and having more people through and you know, taking a bigger cut or you know, a same cut of a lot more folks getting you know, value out of these goods and services so that we can take a little bit more and make more profit. That's really hard to combat and I'm, you know, I'm not like, oh, you know, capitalism is bad, but it's, it's sort of baked into the system that we have and it requires an active like, well, I'm not going to try and do that. I wanna let this thing exist as it is and not try and like, fix it. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway is abandoning this notion that we know better than someone who's working on something that looks at first like, sketchy or weird or it's you know, not it's this informal thing that looks like it's a crime of some kind. I don't know. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I think we're about out of time. Thanks very much. You can always shoot me an email and uh, I'll answer any questions. <laughs>